I'll teach a Father's Day message today. Is that all right? Is that all right with everybody? Well, if it's not, we'll do it anyway. And uh, that's, the, that's the good thing about being the pastor. You can do whatever you want. So um, uh, we're going to do a, a Father's Day message. And, um, and uh, uh, we're going to talk about our, our God, our Father this, uh, this morning. Um, you know, I was just uh, thinking about this before we kind of got started and, and uh, you know, God, our Father. You know, most people don't really have a revelation of God as their Father. You know, you have a large section of, of culture, society that really doesn't think much about God at all. He's never in their thoughts, they, and, and many even question his existence. Of course, if they're, if they're honest with themselves, they will know on the inside that there's more. And, and this didn't just happen. You know, this didn't just happen by accident. Someone had to be involved in this. You know, you can, you, you, you can never just go take a bunch of random stuff and, and throw them up in the air and throw them to a big pile and get order out of that. You know, uh, it doesn't work that way. Someone has to create these things. You know, I heard someone gave an example once, you know, when you see a painting, uh, several years ago, we were at the, uh, the Louvre and, uh, saw the Mona Lisa, saw the painting, this wonderful piece of art, you know, and, and, uh, I don't know who the painter, who's the painter of the, of the Mona Lisa? Leonardo, oh, that guy, yeah. So uh, Leonardo da Vinci, maybe you've heard of him. He's kind of a minor uh, painter. He's not that well known. I didn't know him, but anyway, I did. I just forgot. But um, you know, when you got there and you see the painting, you know that, that it didn't just happen on its own. I mean, it's, I, now when I saw the painting, I wasn't that impressed by it. I remember we, we, we showed up at the Louvre and all these people are crowded around. We knew this is a little map. We know we're close to the Mona Lisa and we get there and there's this giant crowd of people and we're looking around for this wonderful painting, and I didn't realize it's like this big. It's this little tiny thing. It's really small, and, and um, there's all these people standing around it, and we were like, I don't want to wait in that line to get, I mean, it, okay, I, I, I can get a better view on my phone, you know, look and see what it looks like. But the fact that it exists, you know that somebody created it. And so, you know, the people who say I don't believe in God, they're really just lying to themselves. They're just deceiving themselves because all of this is proof that somebody had to create it, right? The chair you're sitting in, you know somebody made it because it's there. And so the fact that we're here, you know that someone created it and created these things and his name is God. And so for those folks, you know, we just pray for them that, 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 that the blindness that the enemy's placed in their life would be removed. That's really what it is. It's blindness. It really doesn't make any sense to believe that. So you have that section of culture, but then you have many others that they see God as this kind of uh, uh, domineering, older gentleman, you know, that that's maybe has slightly bad attitude, you know, he's, he's kind of grumpy, he's the ancient of days, he's really old, you know, and, and had this kind of bad attitude. And several years ago, we, um, we were down at a pastor's friend for an RMAI uh, a meeting in Apopka, which is near Orlando. And uh, this is Reverend Daryl Morgan, been friends of our family for many years. And so uh, we, uh, uh, I don't know if he's going to watch this or not, but anyway, uh, we went and we, we were kind of looking around their different uh, kids' rooms and classrooms. And we do this everywhere we go. We go and take pictures of things and, and went to one of their, their children's church and they had this beautiful mural on the wall and just this amazing mural on the wall and such a detail, I had a bunch of them throughout the church. Well, this particular one was a depiction of Elijah and, and the uh, and the, the prophets of Baal when he was the, the sacrifice that was being made. And so this image was painted and, and of course, you know, Elijah is kind of gray haired and his hair's sticking straight up in the air. Like, you know, it's like there's a, he had a really bad hair day and he had this super intense look on his face and he's standing on the altar and, and on his chest, it says, when God speaks, it was painted when God speaks. And I'm thinking, it was kind of a scary picture, you know, it had a big giant fireball coming down, just this tornado of fire on, on, the, on the ground and hitting the altar and, and he looked really concerned and, and as fire isn't bad enough, you know, that, that you're in the middle of it. I don't think Elijah was standing on the altar when this happened. There was a sacrifice in the altar, but in this painting, Elijah was on the altar with the sacrifice. So this is an even bigger miracle than we knew, right? And so he's on the altar and fire is coming down and it's burning it and he's just standing there with this super panicked look on his face and, and there's lightning in the fire. I mean, it's, if fire's not bad enough, there's lightning in the fire. And I just thought, first of all, if I'm a kid in this church, like, and it says when God speaks, I gotta be honest, don't talk to me, you know, right? Like, like, because if that's what it looks like, a tornado, a lightning tornado of fire, I'll pass. You know, we, we judge the children of Israel when, when Moses came down, you know, and, and they're like, you let God speak to you and then tell us what he said. We judge them. But if it looked like that, 
we would all be a, a little afraid, you know, and a little, a little, thank God that's not the case. But a lot of people have this idea of that's who God is. You know, several years ago, I remember when we used to do our uh, billboards here at the church. I don't know how long ago that was that we stopped that, but we started doing that, Eric, how long ago? Because Eric made most of those uh, 2006, really, that long ago. So we were putting billboards up around town. We had uh, different ones that said, you know, come grow with me and, and uh, different, you know, building the, the blueprint one that we made, different ones. How many remember those? I do want to show you, there was one that we never put up, and I think this was Mike Bauer's idea. And uh, we just didn't know if it would actually work. Eric made it for us, but you can put that up. Um, it was, if you don't go to Impact, you don't know Jack. And so, um, we, you know, we, 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 we thought that might not be the best billboard to represent the church, but they might not get what we mean, because if you don't go to Impact, you probably don't know Jack. But, but um, uh, so we had different billboards. We did, we did one that was the, the pastor, Pastor Anderson was the godfather. Who remembers that? It was kind of the outline. It would look like... We had all sorts of strange responses from that. We, you know, for some reason, I don't know why, some people thought that it was Hitler on the, on the billboard. I mean, no, that's not the best advertisement when, and it wasn't good. So we had to take that one down. So I, we never did see the, 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 what, the silhouette, why that looked that way. But we had one that we ran, and it was called, said, God's not mad at you. And it's on our, it's our current website, which our website is being worked on. And it said, God is not mad at you. And you know, we really didn't get a lot of responses, uh, as far as personal responses, the people talking to me about it from just random people. It was mostly church people that really had a major problem with th this billboard. There were some folks that were really, really upset. How dare you put up a billboard that God's not mad at you? That's really sad, isn't it? But much of the Christian world uh, uh, believes, has this opinion of God as though he is Fire, tornado of fire and lightning, a God of judgment, and, 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 and just he's just mean, and he's mad at you all the time, and always upset with you. And of course, you know, there, is a, there are uh, sides or aspects to the personality of God and who he is. Uh, there is a judgment side. If you don't believe that, ask Sodom and Gomorrah, if you can find them, right? I mean, you know, there is a judgment side of God, and, and, and there, are, there are multiple uh, parts of him. There are multiple aspects of his personality. But judgment and, and these things is not the primary uh, um, personality of God. His, his, per, his personality is that way. He is to us, he is our father, and a lot of times people see him as God, as judger or as condemner, but he is to us as sons and daughters, he's God our Father. And really, it's such an important thing that, that when we approach him in our Christian walk, that we're approaching him the right way. And yes, there are times where we have to make sure the other aspects of the Lord, that we are careful. You know, the Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord, and that word Lord is not speaking of the Lord Jesus, is actually uh, Yahweh, which is the eternal God, the name of God, Yahweh. And it says that the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. And so what is that fear? Is that a cowardness or a, a fearfulness, like you're afraid of him, like you would be afraid of a uh, a tornado of fire and lightning, right? That kind of fear, no, it's a, it's a, it's a respect. It's, a, it's an awe. It's something that you don't want to do anything to displease him. And the Bible says in multiple places that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So there is a part of, of a reverence and an awe in an in extreme respect and carefulness. That's why it's important when we come together, we never treat our time together as just something just casual or ordinary or just say, oh, whatever, I'm going to go to church and mark it off my list. No, we ought to approach our time together with him because when, when we can't gather in his name, we know that he gathers with us. And so when we do that, we need to, out of fear of the Lord, respect of the Lord, of, out of a holy awe of him, we ought to be very, uh, uh, very cautious about those things and make sure we're responding the right way. But that's an aspect of it. But the, the fact that God is our father is a major part of how we approach him. Really, to a lot of areas, it's the difference between success or failure in our life is how we approach him and how we see him as God our Father. There's a lot of different um, aspects of, of who he is and different parts of his personality that are good things, but I wanted to, to as I was kind of getting prepared, I was just zeroed in on the love of God, on the love of our Father. You know, one of the things you think about as a dad, uh, moms and dads, they're there to care and to nurture and to take care of. That's part of who they are. It's a loving relationship. And if you don't know God 
as your father, a loving father, I want you to listen this morning. Because that ability to recognize that part of his personality and the fact that that is the overriding part of who he is. The Bible says that God is love. That's who he is. If you don't recognize that, it'll affect how you walk. It'll affect how you approach him. It'll affect every area of your life, how you approach other people. Because the fact is, our Heavenly Father is a Father of love. Let me tell you this morning, God loves you. Your Father loves you this morning. Let's look at a scripture, some scriptures together. Um, this is in 1 John chapter 3. I've got several that we want to read. 1 John chapter 3, we'll look in uh, the, the verses 1 through 3. This is uh, the New King James. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Now that Father is capital F. He's speaking of, of our Heavenly Father. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. I can't tell you, and there's really no way to even put it into words, and none of us will understand this until we get to the other side, and then we won't fully understand it until we've been there for eons and eons and eons and generations have passed to understand how amazing it is to be a child of God. I mean, we'll get to the other side and we'll be grateful, but we'll, it'll be a continual daily unveiling of how magnificent it is that we're, he's our father and we're his child. He says, what man of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, we are now children of God. And we'll just stop right there. And so we can see that the Bible is very clear to present to us as believers this 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 father-son, this father-child relationship that exists. And this is something that was completely unknown before Jesus came. This was something that wasn't even possible. But through the sacrifice Jesus made, this relationship that God had always wanted to have with humanity was finally opened up and made available. And the good news is this morning, it's been made available to us. Now, the reality is there's two spiritual families in the earth. Just to real quickly, there's two spiritual families in the earth. You have the, the family of God and you have the family of Satan. And there's only two. It doesn't matter what background a person has, what heritage they have, none of those things. There's two spiritual families, the family of God and the family of Satan. And so if you're born again, if a person is in Christ, they're, they're now recreated. They're now all, the Bible says they're, they're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Now all things are of God. They become members of the family of God. And so for, the, for us as the family of God, he now sees us differently. We're not servants. No, well, we serve him. We're not uh, 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 people that are obliged to him, which we do have things that we, are, we owe him. But he sees us as his kids. And it's such an important thing. And it says here that the manner of love which the Father has bestowed on us, this aspect of love is everything. I'm telling you, this, is, this will be really important for some of you. And, and for all of us when we're approaching other people to understand the love of God that God our Father has to his kids and for those that he's wanting to make his kids, right? He's wanting to bring into the family. It's such an important thing. So let's look at this, this subject of love a little bit. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 3. And I've got some really good things uh, written down here. And I said this will be a blessing to you. But Ephesians chapter 3, we'll look at verses 14 through 19 out of the New King James Bible. And uh, this is the Apostle Paul writing and, and wonderful scriptures, and I'm sure you probably are aware of this. It says, for this reason, verse 14, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. It's important that we see this as a family. Amen. Amen. This is a family, praise Amen. God. He looks at it that way, we should look at it that way. Verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through love, that you, now anytime this is, some, this is written like this, we need to take special attention to it, speaking to us individually, that you, that me, that, that we individually need to see this. It says that, um, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, and you may be filled with the fullness of God. Notice it says you be rooted and grounded in what? Love. In love. love. Not rooted and grounded in fear, not rooted and grounded in obligation, but rooted and grounded in love. Amen. 
Now, I say, some might say, well, this is talking about the love of, of, of Christ. Well, we do know that Jesus said that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, some, they asked him, you know, show us the Father and it'll be good. He said, listen, I've been with you all this time. How can you say that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? So Jesus' love is a direct reflection of God's love for us, but it's our foundation. Yes, amen. I said, it's our foundation. Hallelujah. If your foundation is built on anything, your good works. Your foundation can't be there. You can't work good enough, right? Our foundation is in him. And then it opens up. It says the love of God in verse 19, the love of Christ which passed Christ which passes knowledge that you, that we, that me may be, may be filled with all the fullness of God. So the fullness of who he is comes through this foundation of love. The fullness of him is made real to us and unveiled to us and made available through the foundation this, that we're rooted in, the love of God. Yes. It's such an important thing. It's such a vital thing. Wow. Now, this love of Christ, that scripture, just as a side note, this isn't just uh, God's or Christ's love for us, which is all-encompassing. It's also our love for him. Yeah. There's two sides of it. So, but you can't really be in love with him if you don't, aren't aware of the fact that he's really, truly in love with you. Yeah. Amen. We're able to love him because he's first loved us. And so we have to do that. That's how the personality of who he really is, is unveiled. We can talk about the faithfulness of God. We can talk about the goodness of God. You can talk about all those things. But until you grasp the love of him that, that he has for us, none of those topics, none of those realities really take shape. Until you understand the, the, the foundation of this, which is love. You know, I think if there's been different people in the Bible that have failed. Anybody in the room ever failed before? Now, only about 10 hands went up. All, we are in an amazing company. Anybody ever made a mistake before failed, right? Still didn't get everybody. All right, well, anybody ever failed before? Oh, okay, we're, we're slowly getting there. All right, so, and, and, and we'll pray for liars later if you didn't raise your hand. But anyway, um, no, we've all mistaked. All, everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But this revelation of the love of God is everything. I was thinking you have two people in the, in, in the life of Jesus that openly denied him, that, that, that betrayed him. And uh, you have Judas and you have the Apostle Peter. What was the difference between Judas and the Apostle Peter? What was the difference between the two of them? People look at all these different things. They, 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 ran, they, they hung out in the same company. They were both in Jesus' inner circle. They both spent a lot of time that the masses didn't have access to him. The difference was one understood Jesus' love for him and the other did not. One recognized who he was, his character, his nature. The other just recognized what he did and what being with him brought. Being with him is great. There are many benefits to being with the Father, to be a part of the family. There's many benefits, but if our understanding of God is only there, of what he can do for us and the fact that he's God, he's the creator, which are all wonderful things, but if that's as far as it goes, when times of trouble come, then our approach is going to be very different because Peter, when he denied Christ, what did he do? He repented. He, he denied him three times even, not just once. He denied him three times very publicly. And think about it, in, in Jesus' moment of need, not that really Peter could have done anything, but, but when Jesus was in the process of putting it all out there for humanity, Peter denied him. Well, what was the thing that caused him to, to be able to come back into fellowship and get things right? He was rooted and grounded in the love of his father. Expressed through Jesus, he was rooted in, that was his foundation. What was the problem with Judas? Judas just recognized Jesus was an amazing man. He obviously believed who he was. You do know G Judas did believe who Jesus was. And he believed that he was a representation of the Father. And so he obviously had something there in him that, that recognized these things. But he never caught on to the fact that, that God loves me. He was more interested in what he could get from him. That was in how good Jesus was and how, how faithful these, all these wonderful things. But his foundation wasn't in love. And so whenever he committed treason... And of course, you know, he could have gotten, uh, P Judas had been stealing for a long time. Judas had been taking money out of the, out of the money belt, out of, out of the pockets for quite a while. And he loved money. And so he, was, he had been taking things out. He could have gotten that fixed at any point along the way had he recognized the love of God, the love of his father. Had he recognized that, he'd have said, you know, this, is, this isn't right. He just, he just saw Jesus as innocent blood and not the depiction of love that he was. 
And so our understanding of these things is very, very important. So it says here that, that, uh, that being this, what verse are we in? Yeah, that being rooted and grounded love, that you may know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, and you may be filled with the fullness of God. Listen, our love for him is wonderful, but it starts with understanding his love for us. Amen? We'll look at Colossians chapter 3, and, and these are such important things for us. In Colossians chapter 3, and uh, I'm reading some different commentators and, and uh, different ones about these, some of these words here. They're so good. But in Colossians 3, verse 12, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. He goes on and talks. But I want to focus on the first part of this verse. He says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Now, this word elect, uh, there's, it's, it's to, to be personally chosen by God. You can even see in each word that God's heart is being expressed in all of these words. The elect of God, the personally chosen of God. The word holy is, is one that in ancient times it carried the, uh, uh, the idea of awe, respect, and reverence for a holy place or a holy shrine. So we are the elect and holy. God sees us as holy. Talking to believers. Yeah. Those who are members of the family of God, not the other family, but the family of God. He, God, sees you and me as holy. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I have to kind of take a step back and have to think about that a little bit. We know God is holy, and we have awe and respect for him. And in a, in a holy, when we're gathered in his presence, it's a holy place. You know, God sees you as holy. We're specifically chosen, elect. He also sees you. Well, you don't know, Pastor Greg, the stuff I've been doing. God sees you for who he made you to be, right? He sees you through faith. He see, now there's the other side of repentance, and these are important things. But, but God's view, his heart towards us, he is, you are per personally selected by him, and he sees you as holy. It's an amazing thing. This one, one writer wrote this. He said, the use of this word in the New Testament, holy, tells us that once we came to Christ, the blood of Jesus separated us, consecrated us, and made us holy. He removed our past sins and threw them into the sea of forgetfulness, separating uh, our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. <laughs> so when he sees you, yes. I don't know about you, it bugs me when I find a believer, bump into a believer and says, well, I'm just a sinner. It bothers me. It, it, it gets under my skin. No, you were a sinner, but you're now a child of God. God calls you holy. It's been separated. That's how he sees you. But then the next word is beloved. He, you, he sees you. You're the elect of God. You're the holy of God, but you're also the beloved of God. It's an amazing word. That word there is, it comes from the word agape, which is the Greek word for love. And the tense in this is really, really important. This, this means that God has loved us in the past, he still loves us in the present, and he will always love us in the future. Amen. I'm going to say that again. It's, it, it, the tense means everything, and it, it says that he's loved us in the past, he still loves us in the present, and he'll always love us in the future. <laughs> I don't know about you, that blesses me. It blesses me that, that I am the elect, I am the holy, but I'm also the beloved of God. See, these things are important because it, it affects how you approach him. It affects your approach to the Father. Everybody say, I'm beloved. I know it's not a word we use today, but I am, I am the beloved of God. Yes, you know, sin is a thing, and we've talked about repentance here as a church for it, and it's important that we repent, you know, that the, the, the current grace message, I call it the greasy grace message, you know, it's not a good thing, that all sins are forgiven, doesn't matter. No, it matters how we live. There's that side of God that's important. But the basis always goes back to when you do make a mistake, you can then get it straight. Why? Because he loves you. He always has, he does, and he always will. It's an amazing thing. I said, it's an amazing thing. Go to a John 3.16. We said that word beloved is part of the, the word agape. John 3.16, you may have heard this one before. It says, for God so what? Love the world that he gave his only begotten son. This even applies to people who are outside of the family of God. There is such love that's there. God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Like I so said, that word agape, love here in, in, first, or in John 3, 16, is the word uh, for just simply love. And it is the, the God kind of love. Another writer said this about this. He said, the word agape reflects what I call a high-level love 
For there is no higher, finer, more excellent love than agape love. I'm so glad this has been extended towards me. There's no higher than this. It says, in fact, the word agape is filled with so much deep emotion and meaning that it's one of the most difficult words to translate in the New Testament. Trying to explain this word has baffled translators for centuries. centuries. Nevertheless, I'm going to try to clarify the meaning of this powerful word. And I just read that part because I want you to see, you, sometimes you got to dig a little deeper. But to, to get the full depth of what something means. This is how God sees you. He says agape occurs when an individual sees, recognizes, understands, or appreciates the value of an object or person, causing the viewer to behold this object or person in great esteem, awe, admiration, wonder, and sincere appreciation. We're talking about the love of God, the love of our Father towards us. Remember, that's our foundation. I'm going to read that again. It, it, it's when the viewer is talking about God, when he's looking at us, our Father looking at us, beholds us with great esteem, awe, admiration, wonder, and sincere appreciation. We don't really fully understand how God looks at us. I know about you. I've been times in my life where my viewpoint of, of God I know he's my father, but I really feel like he's tolerating me. Right, right. Anybody been there before? It's me again, Lord. Right, you know, like, oh, it, oh it's me again. I'm sorry. You want to back in the room, like, you know, like, oh, hey, God. No, that's not his view of us at all. Now, there are times when he's not pleased by our behavior, but the foundation of how he approaches us is this one of awe. It, I love that. It's, it's admiration, great esteem, uh, awe, wonder, sincere appreciation. Yeah. That's how God views you and me. Wow. It's Father's Day. and Our Father looks at us that way today. I'm telling you, this will change how you approach him. It says, such great respect is awakened in the heart of the observer. This is talking about him. For the person or object he is beholding, that he is compelled. God is compelled. Our Father is compelled. Driven. Can't help himself. But to love us. In fact, his love for that person or object is so strong that it's irresistible. I mean, understanding the love of God, that's why it's our foundation. Had Judas just known that he was irresistible to his father, he was irresistible to Jesus, that even in the midst of stealing for all of those years, I wonder, I, I, I just wonder, what if Judas, Judas, after he had actually turned him over and, and told him where to find Jesus, what if, what if he had run up to him as they're taking away and said, I'm I am so dumb, and I'm so sorry. What if he had done that? We don't know. The reality is Peter basically did the same thing. He basically, by denying him, basically did the same thing, yet he, he ran back. Why? His foundation was one of love. He knew that the Father loved him. It wasn't just mean God, just, just judgment of God, which, like I said, there's an aspect of the judgment of God, but but our foundation in the beginning is God loves us. Let's look at another verse. Is that all right? Yeah. This is Ephesians chapter 2. I've, I've, I've looked at this a, a little bit here lately. You've probably heard this verse. Steve referenced it again last week. Ephesians 2.10. This is out of the New King James. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now these are not works unto salvation. You can't earn it. But these are works resulting from salvation. When you come to know him, he has good things for you to do, right? And it says that uh, these are things that uh, were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that what we should walk in them. God has something for each of us, things that he has designed us to do. We've been talking about it. But I'm going to read this out of, the, out of the, uh, the New Living. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things he planned for us long ago. You read the New King James, we see we're his workmanship. You know, hammering away on us and sawing, doing all these things, you know. But you read the New Living, it says we're his masterpiece. In Christ, that's why this is such good news. In Christ, you're not just something he created, 
No, in the original creation, when he, he, he saw that he created, what did he say when he saw it? He looked and he said it was, that's good. That's good. If God calls something good, that's pretty good, right? His standards are pretty high, right? And if he said, I would be happy if he looked at me and was like, yeah, that's, that's all right. Okay, I'll take all right, you know? But he looked at creation, he said, it's good. But notice, even after man fell, even after sin entered in, after the human race created, uh, 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 tr- committed treason, Jesus came by the love of the Father. His blood was shed for us. And those who have accepted this and given their life, they now are in Christ Jesus. It went from good to a masterpiece. <laughs> I'm telling you. When God looks at, as, as, as sons and daughters of God, when God sees us, his love is not just like he had a boy. He is, you're his masterpiece. That's incredible. I said, that's incredible. Do we have any artistic people in the room? People artistic, see some hands going up a few. I know you are. I worked for you back when I was a teenager. She had a, uh, uh, an art supply store. And we have some, now I like to create some things. And, and I know there's more because hand, more hands didn't go up. I know some of you make things. I, Drew and I were talking recently. He's taken over doing, uh, he's doing all the, the graphics for the youth department. He's actually done our, our, uh, our, our usual current running welcome goodbye slide. Doing a great job. So he and I have been talking about some of these things. He said, you know, I'm making this stuff. And, and when you're looking at, as you're making stuff, you just keep going back to it and, and looking at it over and over and over again. If you ever draw something, paint, paint something that you're creating, it gets your attention. And, and you, you just kind of get, for lack of a better word, you kind of get obsessed about it, right? You just can't keep your eyes off of it. And when you do something that's really good, some of you work, you do, you're like, yeah, that was a, that was a learning project. Then others, you, that, those I'll delete or get rid of. But the ones I do are really, you put that on Instagram. You're like, oh, oh look what I did. You know, and you feel like it's something really good. You want to show it off. Well, God, as the ultimate creator, created this whole thing. And when he was done, he looked at it and he, he said, this is, this, is, this is my masterpiece. Masterpiece goes a step beyond everything else. Pluto is wonderful. You know, all of those things are great. Is Pluto even a planet anymore? Poor Pluto. We don't even know what happens to Pluto. It was a planet. Now it's not a planet. Poor Pluto. Let's pray for Pluto. Um, all of these things. New campaign. Pray for Pluto. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run for president with that, uh, that, uh, that platform. I'm going to pray. Pray for Pluto. We can bring it back into the fold. But, um. All these things he created were wonderful, but this says we're his masterpiece. So it, God is, con- it carry, that carries the idea he can't take his eyes off of you. He's not just God, he's God your father, and he is, in a good sense, obsessed with you. Why is this such a big deal? Because it affects everything about how you approach him. The Bible talks about, you know, entering into his presence to find help, you know, mercy and, and grace to help in time of need. How can you do that with, to come boldly into the presence? How can you do that? You have to know that my father loves me. You have to know that my father is, is it, not just he loves me, like the prodigal son or any issue, he's always looking my direction. One of the other guys comes up, you know, Michael the archangel, and he's, he's trying to talk to the father. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah I hear you. Yeah, yeah, go take care of that. He's just, he's looking at you. When it comes to meeting the needs that you have in your life, when if it's, well, if, it, if, you, if you approach them based on what you deserve, you're never gonna, it's never gonna work. But if you approach them on the fact that your father loves you, your father is consumed for you. Listen, I just want you to, to just take a step back on Father's Day. And let's not just look at God as creator, which he is, but, but on Father's Day, recognize he's your dad. You know, I, re- I realize it's kind of getting this together, you know, that not everybody has maybe the greatest example of a dad, naturally speaking. I certainly have, have, have not been perfect. I, I can't tell how many times I've had to apologize to my kids, you know, about stuff. And parents, that's a great thing to do, <laughs> to apologize to your kids. I've had to say, listen... Your dad was an idiot, you know, and uh, I apologize. Don't be like your dad, you know. Take the good things, don't do that. You know, we've, we've, we've all been there before. 
But you know, I realize that sometimes people have grown up in ways maybe a dad wasn't present or a bad example of a father. And, and we're not, you know, we're not trying to be judgmental. You know, people are dealing with stuff. But a lot of times it can affect how you approach God. It can affect your approach to him. And really, our, our natural relationships, dads, we ought to be endeavoring to be the right example of our heavenly father to our children. But I want to encourage you, if you've come from a situation, maybe it wasn't the best example of being a father, get to know him in his word. Yes. Get to know him in his word. Say, well, I don't like the sound of that. He's written you a love letter. He's expressed his will and his heart towards you. He's, he's, he's made all of these things. Of get, begin to get to know him there. If you'll step out in faith and approach him the right way, he'll unveil himself in your life. Yes. I'm, I, can t- I'm, I just want to tell you, your father can be trusted. I said, your father can be trusted. Your father can be counted on. Your father can be relied upon. Your father can be relied upon. Yeah, but you don't know, I, I've done all this. has nothing to do with it. At the very foundation, he is obsessed with you in the most wonderful possible way. His attention is solely on you. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing to know the love of Christ, which is the love of the Father. It's everything in our life. It's our foundation. It's our, it's our foundation in life. Let's all stand.